Welcome, everyone, to the VBC Bible Institute and podcast, and welcome back to our course, A Journey Through the Bible. Yes, we've taken a slight detour. We are currently doing a kind of a study on typology, and we will get back to that. But while we're doing the study of typology, which we're doing right here in the book of Genesis, and the reason we're doing that is because there's a lot of things in the book of Genesis that people use for typology. And so we're, we will get back to that probably Wednesday, if everything works out. We're, Wednesday nights are going to become basically VBC, Bible Institute, and podcast nights here at Victory Baptist Church. That is the plan, is to make Wednesdays always that. We will be probably trying to throw in some uh, Sunday school hour for the VBC Bible Institute. So we're going to be a lot more teaching. We'll be coming uh, to the Bible Institute and pod, uh, the Bible Institute podcast it, uh, probably more will be occurring, um, and 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 that's re- the reason was because we're back to in-person services, and a lot of that teaching I like to do for the Bible Institute with people present. I like to ask those questions, have them throw out their thoughts and their comments, and because of that, uh, that we'll be able to increase the amount of teaching. Um, I still was kind of caught off guard when everything kind of got locked down, and I was like, okay, how do I how do I proceed with the Bible Institute now? Because it's it's very it's very different sitting here in an empty room trying to do some of this stuff for the Bible Institute versus standing behind the pulpit and there's people right there and I can kind of do I kind of it, it kind of fulfills maybe the way I pictured it from the beginning. I, I've tr- I've tried to explain so many times one of the most in, most important times in my life was the Bible Institute I went to in Nebraska, where Saturday mornings I would get there, I don't know, 7.30 in the morning, 7, uh, 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning, and we would be there till 5 p.m. in the evening with a break for lunch in the middle of the day, and we're there all day. And just, it was so different. It was just uh, a group of guys, uh, the pastor, and and just spending hour after hour talking about the Bible. It wasn't always done like in a lecture form. It was done more like, hey, let's sit around and talk about this section of scripture. And I really, there was a lot there. I really, I miss, I miss it so much at times. So I'll kind of, I'm trying to create that same kind of idea and feeling here, but it's more, it's difficult to do so, especially when I'm in a room by myself. Now, when people are here in the church, then it, it comes across that way. A lot of times people will hear our sermons the way I do my sermons, and they're like, "That it's really weird the way you do that. And I, I understand that, but we've, we've always tried to do things differently. I try to interact with the crowd a lot. I try that. Like, like because you're not here to listen to me, you're here to participate. And that's the same idea I have for the Bible Institute podcast. You're not here to listen to me, you're here to participate. I like you not just sitting back going, oh, that's what he has to say. I want you involved. So it, it that's that's the vibe I'm trying to create. Uh, I'm not done a perfect job. I mean, I've already looked back at a lot of things we've done in the Bible Institute, and there's a lot of things I regret that they didn't work out quite the way I've wanted to. So I, I, I stated from the beginning, this is a work in progress. It still hasn't taken shape exactly the way I want to, but I hope people will find something here to be grateful for and appreciative of and uh, we're just going to continue to work slowly but surely. And, and so this is what we're doing. We've taken the detour for typology, but today we're going to continue in Genesis. So what I'm going to do, the, what, I'm going to try to have two kind of paths going on. We're going to work and complete that study on typology. And then at the same time, being trying to proceed and move and advance the discussion in Genesis 14 into Genesis 15. So whenever we take these detours, I'm not going to try to let it stop the other as well. They'll just be happening parallel to one another, okay? So here's something I want you to do, though. Here's something I want you to do, all right? We're talking about typology, right? Where you read the text, but you think that that, that really points to something else. It pictures something else. There's the words but it pictures something else. I want you to do something. In Genesis chapter 13, at the very end, we see that Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. All right? Or Mamre. Um, So two places are mentioned. The plain of Mamre, or Mamre, which is in Hebron. 
These two places are mentioned. If when we were listened to Dr. J. Vernon McGee on Genesis 13, he took those two places, Mamre and Hebron, and he he said that their names rep, re, uh, represent something. And then he, he tried to say that it's a good thing for you and I to dwell right there, to dwell the same way. So in other words, those places picture kind of a state uh, that you and I as Christians can dwell in. I'm not going to give any any of it away. You may remember that. You may not remember it. But look up those two, the two words and and look them up and then see what, what the, the words represent. And then ask yourself, is that the goal here? Is that the picture here? Is this just a Hebrew? Is this just a historical text? It's just a, 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 a historical text telling us where Abraham went, went and where he dwelt. He, he dwelt in the plain of Mamre. And again, Mamre, Mamre which is in Hebron. Is it just there to describe, just give us the details, the historical details, or is it there to picture some kind of spiritual state that you and I are to dwell in? I would I would definitely challenge you to look those up and let me know what you find. And then once you find it, then you have to justify, no, 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 this is a picture. This is picturing something. This is not just giving us the historical details. This is giving us a picture. If, if Whichever way you go, justify it. If you think it's just historical details, doesn't have any spiritual picture, then justify that. If you think it does, then by all means, let me know. I'll, I'll be very uh, interested in hearing. I want to go back and play that section from Dr. J. Vernon McGee, but I'm not going to do that because I want you to look it up. But we will return to that. Um, probably, we probably will work on that a little bit, maybe in our typology uh, lessons. We, we may do that. So uh, we will see. All right. And again, uh, the typology lesson, I think, was very good. And we're going to really dig into it because one in the first Bible Institute I ever went to, we spent a lot of time uh, talking about typology and the book of Genesis. And I've got that textbook. It's sitting up there at the pulpit right now. And so I'm going to utilize that um, and, and that discussion. But for now, let's get back to Genesis 14. All right. Genesis 14. We're going we're gonna to do a lot of uh, review here, but I, I want to put this all back together and we'll see how far we can uh, go this uh, Saturday. It's Saturday here and, uh, while I'm doing this live broadcast. We're going to listen to Genesis 14 be read again, and then we're going to go back and we're going to utilize J. Vernon McGee to get us through Genesis 14. Again, we're using uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee's material by uh, by the approval of his ministry. They gave us permission, uh, so they, they gave us the permission to use it. We are very grateful for that, so I'm going to try to utilize it. I've utilized it a lot in the beginning, and then I t- kind of took a break from it, but we're going to utilize it whenever I, I want to utilize it. And uh, I think Genesis 14 is a good chapter to utilize it in. So that's that's what we're going to do. So are you ready? First, we're going to listen to the chapter. Be read again. Do not ever think. I don't want to hear it read again. Don't ever think that way uh, because no, you, we can never hear the scriptures read to us enough. We can never read them enough. There's not enough time in your life or my life to read the scriptures enough. There's never anything as reading it too many times. It's the inspired word of God. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to go back and re-listen to what J. Vernon McGee has already said in regards to Genesis 14 and then press on to the end of the chapter. All right, here we go. Chapter 14. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elazar, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Chedorlaomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came to Chedorlaomer, and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims, and Ashtaroth, Carnaim, and the Zuzims, and Ham, and the Emims, and Sheva, Kiriathaim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, unto El Faran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned, and came to 
in Mishpat, which is in Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazanan Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim, with Chedorlaomer the king of Elam, and with Tidal king of nations, and Amraphel king of Shinar, and Arioch king of Eleazar, four kings with five. And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their victuals, and went their way, and they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. And there came one that had escaped, and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Anner. And these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, three hundred and eighteen, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer, and of the kings that were with him, at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons, and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the Possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, unless thou shouldst say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion." Okay, there's Genesis chapter 14. That's the word of the Lord. We should always reverence it and respect it. Um, and now we're going to go to Dr. J. Vernon McGee as he works through Genesis 14. Here we go. And this seems to have been his home. That's where he's buried today. This is the place that he wanted to go. Now that brings us to chapter 14 of Genesis, and here in chapter 14, we find the first war, and Abraham delivers Lot, and we find the first priest, Abraham blessed by Melchizedek. These are the two great truths that are here. And in one sense, this is one of the most remarkable chapters, doesn't seem to fit in with the story at all. You feel like it could be left out that there's a continuity without it. But may I say again, it's one of the most important chapters that we have in the book of Genesis. And we have in this chapter a very remarkable account of two things, the first war and then this first priest, Melchizedek. Now let's come to the first here because this is extremely important. It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Eleazar, Shedor Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. 
That's a very good exercise, as you can see in pronunciation. But this is a very important chapter. Now we find here that, first of all, this is a historical document. The kings of the east defeat the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what we have here in the first 11 verses. And for quite a few years, the critical, radical scholars rejected this. They said that these men do not appear in history at all, that they are not in secular history, and that this was a rather ridiculous story. Did you know today that these men had been found on monuments and they'd been found on tablets and that they did exist? In fact, Amraphel is the Hammurabi of secular history. And note this, because it's very important to get this before us here. This is tremendously significant that we have here. Now we find that there was war, and this is the first war that's mentioned. So you see, mankind began early in making war. And now we find that these were joined together in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Shador Leomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. Now, that was what brought the kings of the east, and they came against Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, this is nothing in the world but a historical record, and I'm not intending to read this verse by verse here. And you probably noticed that we've pretty much read the first part of Genesis verse by verse and have dealt with it. That is something I wish we could do for the entire Bible But there are times when we'll pass over sections, and we're doing that right here. Now, the kings of the east, they come, and they overcome the kings that have joined together around the Dead Sea, the lower part of it. And they're on their way to take back these as captives. Now, if you have a map, and it's nice to have a map in the back of your Bible you turn to, you'll find out they almost went by Abraham's tent in order to leave the Dead Sea, go back up through the Fertile Crescent, and then go back to the land that they came from in the east. Now, we're going to follow that next time because we're going to see Abraham doing a very remarkable thing as he, with a surprise attack, rescues Lot. Now, if you found your place in the Bible at Genesis 14, we're putting in at verse 12 today. Now, we saw last time the first war, and I found myself very hesitant because I did not know how far to go into it. And I feel that we should not probably develop a section like that too much, but Here is a very interesting side line for somebody to follow through, and you will find it very absorbing and very interesting. This is a historical document that tells of a war, the first war that's recorded. I do not know whether it was the first war that ever took place. I don't think that's the intention of the writer. The purpose here is because Lot is involved, the nephew of Abraham. But we find that the kings of the east defeat the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. And frankly, they evidently had fought before because they had them in subjugation and they had reached the place where they had rebelled. Now, the thing that had happened was that Lot lived in Sodom and Lot was taken captive. And Abraham goes out and defeats the kings of the east and delivers Lot. The question arises, how could he do it? Well, let's look at this. And as I suggested before, that when the kings of the east left the area of Sodom and Gomorrah, they moved north along the west bank of the Dead Sea. And frankly, it's not too far from Hebron and Mamre where Abraham was dwelling. You can stand where Abraham stood in that day, and you can see any movement that takes place down toward the Dead Sea. And so when word was brought to Abraham and it was brought to him, he immediately began to pursue the enemy as he moved north. Now, will you notice this? And they took Lot 
Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. Now, that's Genesis 14, 12, and that's the reason this war is significant to the record here. It reveals what Abraham's going to do in connection with his nephew. Now, verse 13, there came one that had escaped, told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite. Now, stop right there, just so, because uh, I think I continue to miss to, to pr- mispronounce it, Mamre is how you say it. Mamre, I think I was saying Mamre. I don't even remember how I was saying it. Mamre. Now, just uh, j- I just want to just draw your attention to something. In chapter 13, verse 18, Mamre and Hebron. Okay, that's where Abram dwelt. And many will say uh, Mamre and Hebron, if you look up the meaning of their name, it represents dwelling in this kind of place, right? In other words, it's like a state a spiritual state which we can dwell. Now, you can look it up and you can draw that conclusion. But what's fu- funny is you have Mamre and Hebron that people are like, hey, this is a great place to dwell right here in, in between Mamre and Hebron because it represents this. Well, does that does that same representation hold up when you get into chapter 14 where now uh, you've got, you know, um, uh, that uh, verse uh, chapter 13, and there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre. So he's in the plain of Mamre. He's dwelling there. That supposedly is this great place. And the next thing you know, well, now he's going to get this news of what's happened to Lot. So does, does in other words, does Mamre always hold this supposed idea of representing something spiritual. That's one of the things with typology. We can say, hey, look, this represents this. And then two chapters later, you're like, wait a minute. Does that does that stay true? Does that hold true all the way through? Or is it just because we want to see it there? So just, again, I want you to look up Mamre and Hebron. I still want you to do this. What do their names mean? May, and, and check it in a number of lo- uh, places, another of sources, because some sources may disagree and go, okay, these are what the names represent. Do, does that picture something spiritual or is it just the names of the place where he dwelt and there is no spiritual significance? I know I continue to go back to that over and over and over again because I just think it's, it's interesting. So Mamre and Hebron, apologize if I stated it incorrectly at the beginning. I don't even remember how I stated it because I was doing a number of things going on here behind the scenes while all of that was going on. So I was trying to do like 10 things um, at the same time, which uh, I apologize. All right, here we go. Brother of Eschol and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. Now you see Abram has a group of men that are with him. Actually, they had to stand together in that day because of the pursuit of an enemy or the approach of an enemy. And there was safety in numbers, or they either had to hang together or hang separately. Now, the thing that's startling here to us is this, and it reveals something of the extent of Abraham's possessions. Verse 14 of Genesis 14, And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Dan's up in the north. Now, 318. That gives you some conception of the number of servants that Abraham had. In his own household, he could arm 318. Well, how many did he have that he couldn't arm? For instance, women and children, the old folk. But he could arm 318. Now, he's carrying on, may I say, quite a business in that area, raising cattle and sheep and that type of thing. Now, verse 15, he divided himself. Now, here's the way he did it. He divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left bank of Damascus. Now, you see, he pursued them all the way north to Damascus. Now, that's quite a stretch. What Abraham apparently did here, he divided his servants, and one group would make an attack from the rear as they were pursuing them. The other group went around, and when the enemy 
turn to fight the first group, you could see what would happen. He'd come down upon them. And as a result, he was able to get a victory. At least he was able to scatter them so that they fled across the desert and left the people they had captured in the booty. Now, he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. You see, they were taking the women and the people as slaves. Now, a couple of things here. Just remember, I want you to work on Mamre and Hebron because that fits with our typology teaching, and we will, we will address it there. Also remember, I've wanted you to, to look up the just war doctrine. I want you to look that up and make sure you know the basic tenets of the just war doctrine, um, just war theory, because um, Christians, we need to have some understanding of war, how we understand war, what's a Christian understanding of war. So I want you to do that as well. Um, and so just make sure you're working on those things. And again, you can send them to me at newsif at yahoo.com. We will do some teaching on war at some point. We'll probably do some teaching on the just war doctrine. I kind of want to do it now, but we will see. Maybe before we move out of chapter 14, we will. But that's one of the big issues here in, in, in Genesis 14 is the subject of war. Now, it just it just gives us the account. It doesn't offer any moral judgment on it. It just gives us the account of it. And that's what happens a lot in, in um, historical narratives. Now, Abram has done a tremendous thing, of course, and he did it because of his nephew Lot. That is it very definitely, and that's the reason that all of this is mentioned here. And I would say for this reason and another reason we'll see when we get into the next chapter, Abram very definitely is not having a chapter put in here that's extraneous. It's uh, along with the life of Abraham and very important. Now, it's very important for what follows. Notice, the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Shador Laomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. The king of Sodom went out to meet him. Now, someone else is going to come out and meet Abram. And it's a good thing that he did because... The king of Sodom is putting him in grave danger, at least temptation. Now, will you notice verse 18? And even Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And I have several questions here, and I'm sure that you do. To begin with, my point is, where in the world did this man Melchizedek come from? He just walks out on the page of Scripture with bread and wine, and he blesses Abraham, and he walks off of the page of Scripture, and that's it. And I wonder where he came from, and I wonder where he's going, and I wonder what his business is. And I find out he's king of Salem, but he's also priest of the Most High God. Now I have another question. How did he find out about the Most High God? Well, he found out somewhere El Elyon, the Most High God, the creator of heaven and earth. In other words, the living God, the God of Genesis 1 the God of Noah, the God of Enoch. This is the one, not a local deity. And Lupole in his book on Genesis says this is strictly a monotheistic conception. And Dr. Zwema in his Origin of Religion says this reveals there was monotheism before polytheism. In other words, all man had a knowledge of the living and true God. And Paul said, When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. And what did they do? They became vain, and down they went and began to worship the creature more than the Creator. But here is a man who is high priest, and he's high priest for the world of that day. Now, he had a knowledge of the living and true God. He was a priest of the living and true God. And he comes out and he brings bread and wine to Abram. And those are the elements of the Lord's Supper. And I wonder what he had in mind. How much? Okay, now, 
Oh boy, there's so much we can do here. And I don't know exactly how we're going to work all of this, but we will, we're definitely going to have to do uh, some extensive study here. So I'm going to give a lot of, for things for you to do. So let, let's go back and let me just hand these assignments to you. All right. Mamre and Hebron, look those up. What do those names mean? Do, do they represent something or is it just locations in a historical narrative? What should we do? War. Look up the uh, the just war doctrine. Make sure you have the main elements of the just war doctrine. You don't have to do anything else. I'm not asking you to write a paper on it or anything. just just have them down. And then I want you to look up an entry in a Bible dictionary about priest. All right, and write down three or four things you learn about priest from a Bible dictionary. All right, a, a good Bible dictionary. Look up an entry on priest, and then you know what you have to do. You know what you have to do. All right. Now we're going to work on Melchizedek. Here's what I need you to do. Here is your here is your assignment for Melchizedek. Number one, find every verse in the Bible that mentions Melchizedek. Number two, look up what his name means. You can use the Blue Letter Bible app. All right, you can do that. Number three, look up Melchizedek in a Bible dictionary. And I want you to write down about five things you, you learn about Melchizedek from the meaning of the name to the other passages where he's mentioned, and from the Bible dictionary. Just list out five things that you learn about Melchizedek. It doesn't have to be like, what well, I've already knew these things. That's okay. Just write them down again, that you learned them again, and looking these things up. Make sure when you say you learned it, write, write down the source, okay? I got this from the Blue Letter Bible app. I got this from this dictionary. I got this from this verse, all right? At least five things you learn about Melchizedek, because there are lots of different ideas and theories in regards to him. He does just show up out of nowhere. He walks off the page and you're like, wait, what was all of that about? What was that? Now, this is one of those situations. Remember typology we talked about? This is one of those situations. Is the text giving you a clue here? Hey, there's something more going on here than meets the eye. All right. There's something else going on here that meets the eye. What is going on here? What is happening? That's what we're going to have to figure out. Now, sometimes we like Mamre and Hebron, is there something else going on that meets the eye or is it just naming places? Do we need to see something that's not there? But when it comes to Melchizedek, I think there's enough here to go, wait, something, there seems to be more here. What is that? And that's what I want you to work on. All right. Which did Melchizedek now? Well, Melchizedek is mentioned three times in Scripture. We have him mentioned in the 110th Psalm. That's prophetic. Thou art there you go. See, um, now you're, you're getting some of this done for you. Some of this is done for you. They say three times in Scripture. All right. So that's going to be easy for you to find. They say Psalm 110. They say it's prophetic. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, when we get to Hebrews, and he's mentioned several times in Hebrews, and when we were... Now, stop right here. I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to do a little bit more than he's doing here. Let's go to Psalm 110. Psalm 110 has an interesting, an interesting place in church history. We may do a little, uh, a little work on Psalm 110 um, at some point, but in Psalm 110, let's see where we see this here. Psalm 110, um, Oh, yeah. Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. There's Psalm 110, 4. So he's mentioned in Genesis 14. He's mentioned in Psalm 110, verse 4. Psalm 110, verse 4. Okay. So keep that. So in other words, if you're writing these things down, things you learn just from the script. We haven't even, I'm not even considering a, a dic dictionary entry yet. I'm not looking up the meaning of his name, but I can already give you some things that we've learned, right? In Genesis 14, what do we learn about Melchizedek? He was a priest and a king. That's important. What do we learn about uh, him in Psalm 110 verse 4? That there is an order of Melchizedek, a priestly order of Melchizedek. What, what does that mean? What, what? How do we understand that? All right. And then he's mentioned a number of times in Hebrews. In our two and a half year program, I dwelt on Melchizedek a great deal, which means we'll dwell on him more when we get to Hebrews again. But let me just say this, that now I know why that nothing is said about his origin. Nothing is said about his 
Papa and his mama. And that's strange because the book of Genesis is the book of families. It tells about the beginnings of these families. And every time you have a man mentioned that's important here in the line, as this man Melchizedek is, his papa and mama is mentioned. He's the son of so-and-so. Or these are the generations of so-and-so. And we don't have the generations of Melchizedek. Now, that is very important. And here's the reason why. This very much fits with our typology. See, when the text gives you a clue that something is going on, maybe that, that goes beyond what we see with the eye, what we're reading, because he's correct. Every other person pretty much in Genesis, anyone of significance, we're told his origin. Here's his family. So-and-so begat so-and-so. We, in many cases, we have some, some understanding of the origin of the person, but in, with Melchizedek, we do not. He just shows up, and then he's mentioned in other places of Scripture. Another place he's mentioned is Hebrews chapter 7, all right? For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. Now we see him in Hebrews chapter 7. So Genesis 14, Psalm 110, Hebrews chapter 7. Look up and read all of those sections and figure out what can you learn about Melchizedek, Melchizedek from those verses. Don't try to interpret them. Just what do you see there? He's a priest and a king. There's an order of Melchizedek. Okay, what do you see in Hebrews 7? Just, just observation, not interpretation, observation. All right, if you start interpreting bad, wrong, okay, don't do that. All right, very important, okay, very important. Then look up the, min, uh, the meaning of his name. You can use the Blue Letter Bible app for that. That's absolutely free. And then look up Melchizedek and a dictionary and see. And then try to have at least five things you learn about Melchizedek. At least five, okay? And, and we'll, 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 we're going to have to do some work on this at, at some point. All right, let's continue. Why don't we? Well, the writer to the Hebrews makes that very clear. The reason is that he had no father or mother, beginning or ending of days, because later on, the priesthood of Christ in its inception is after the order of Melchizedek. But after the order of service, it follows the order of Aaron in what our Lord did in the service, like the sacrifice of himself and entering the Holy of Holies, which is heaven today. But in his person, our Lord had no beginning or end of days. You see, as king, he's son of Abraham. He's son of David. That's important. Matthew tells us that. But as the great high priest, and that is something important to see in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. But he has no beginning or ending of days as far as creation is concerned. He is the eternal God who came out of heaven's glory, and the Word was made flesh, and we beheld His glory, John says. So what you have here is a marvelous picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and He brings forth bread and wine. I know now why He does it, because our Lord says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death till He comes. And Melchizedek is remembering the death of Christ here. And on that basis, he blesses Abraham. Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, El Elohim, the Creator. And this man is the high priest in that day of the world. And the Lord Jesus is the great high priest for the world today. And the Lord Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek, not Aaron here. But Aaron was just for Israel and for just a tabernacle, and it gives us a marvelous picture. But in his person, he is after the order of Melchizedek. Now, that is important to see. And we are told here, verse 20, "...and blessed be the Most High God, which delivered thine enemies into thy hands, and he gave him tithes of all." And Abraham paid tithes to him here at the very beginning. And why do you know about paying tithes? All right, we move on. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. This is the temptation. 
According to the code of Hammurabi of that day, this man Abraham had a perfect right to the booty and even the persons. But the king of Sodom is clever. He says, give us the persons. You take the booty. It's yours. And that was a temptation to Abraham. And forever after, the king of Sodom, when anybody would say, my, that man Abraham is certainly a wealthy man. God has blessed him. And I think that the king of Sodom would say, bless him your foot. God didn't bless him. I gave it to him. I am the one who made him rich. Abraham knew that. And listen to Abraham now. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. You see, he's still under the influence and the blessing of Melchizedek. And it's a good thing he met Melchizedek. You know, God always prepares us for any temptation that comes to us. And he says he'll never let any come to us that we're not able to bear. And so he prepared Abram for this. Listen to Abram now. That I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, a shoestring, and that I'll not take anything that's thine, lest thou should say I've made Abram rich. You see, Abram, when he started out, he made a covenant with God. He said, Oh God, I'm not entering this war in order to get booty. I'm not after possessions. I want to restore and recover my nephew Lot and permit me to do that. And God permitted him. And now Abram tells the king of Sodom, this is a witness to the king. He said, I worship the living and true God. And I've taken an oath. I wouldn't take anything. And you can't make me rich. I won't even let you give me a shoestring or a piece of thread. Because even if you did that, you'd run around and say you made me rich. But you didn't. If I get rich, God will have to do it, of course. Now, will you notice verse 24? Save only that which the young man have eaten, and the portion of man which went with me, Aner, Eskal, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Now, these others, they have a right to it. They can have it, but I'm not taking anything. The young men that were with me, what they ate, they're not to restore that to you, because actually that is their pay. They're pay for serving you and for delivering you. But for me, you won't give me a thing. Now, we come to chapter 15. All right, there, that concludes J. Verda McGee's teaching on chapter 14. Now, he goes through some of these chapters really quick, which is probably what I should do, but there's too much in this chapter for us to do that, all right? So, chapter 13 ends with Mamre and Hebron. That connects to our typology study. So you need to look up Mamre and Hebron. What do their names mean? And does this represent some kind of spiritual state that it's good for us to dwell in? Or is it just giving us locations for the historical narrative? You have to draw that conclusion. Then chapter 14 mentions all these kings and a war. A war takes place. All right. What do you need to believe about war? Look up the just war doctrine and make sure you have the basic elements written down. What are the basic elements of the just war doctrine? Make sure you have that down. If you have any problem finding access to the information about the just war doctrine or just war theory, let me know. The Catholic Catechism is a good source to find a good discussion about the just war doctrine, right? And we will look at that at some point. Next, we have the idea of priest mentioned here. So look up uh, an entry for priest in a dictionary. Write down three or four things you learn about priest, all right? And then, and, and, and I don't know if I've already mentioned that today, but definitely do that. And then Melchizedek is a priest and king. Look up an entry. Uh, we'll do all the things I showed you to do for Melchizedek. Find all the scriptures where he is mentioned. Look up the meaning of his name. Look up a Bible dictionary and write down five things you learn in regards to Melchizedek. The reason I want to throw in the idea of looking up uh, the entry for priest is because I want you to have a good understanding of priest and because Melchizedek is a priest, all right? So that's why I want you to do that, all right? Now, so there you have it. There are all your assignments. Very straightforward. I want to do something about Melchizedek right now. I want to, but we won't. We won't. We will do that. Uh, yeah, we're, we're going to work on that soon. We're going to work on that soon because there's so much there to try to understand. But what I want you to realize is that sometimes the text, when you're look, do, working on typology, going, well, that could represent this, that could represent that. You've always got to be careful. But when the text seems to be throwing something out there that doesn't quite make sense in the Hebrew, in the, in the uh, Hebrew, in the uh, historical narrative, that's always a good clue to go, wait a minute. 
He just shows up. There's no origin here. He just walks away. Then he shows up again in Psalm 110. He shows up again in Hebrews. Wait, I think we need to stop and spend some considerable amount of time on Melchizedek, and we will do just that coming up. But in the meantime, you have to start working on it right now. All right, if you have any problems, any confusion, don't understand your assignments, email them to email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, and trust me, I'm right here to help you. That's why, that's why the Bible Institute exists. I'm here to benefit you. So anything I can do, just let me know. All right, I'll stop right there. You have, you've got a lot to do. Get to it. All right. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. Get to it. All right, thank you. Have a great day. God bless.